Welcome to the Jeff Knows Inc. Show with your host, Jeff Lopes, where we bring you the world's top athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, influencers, and their journeys to success. We are live. We are live in the Jeff Knows Inc. Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Lopes. Super excited to have on today, Robbie Rowland. Robbie's a, a gentleman I've been actually following for a while because my son plays ball. He's a pitcher. And I, I, I'm amazed by everything he's done, how he's built a brand. Um, I've been an entrepreneur for 27 years. So everybody knows my background. And today's going to be all about Robbie. I, I, I want to kind of go through his journey, playing when he, when he first picked up a baseball, having his dad. Your dad played in the majors, correct? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So we're we're gonna talk about this. Let's let's talk. Let's when was when did baseball start becoming a passion for you? What age? Oh my gosh. Um this is gonna sound like a joke, but probably like right when I was born. Yeah. <laughs> I was uh but but like it's serious though. Like I I was very fortunate. Like I say that all the time. Um, because my dad was playing when I was born. So when I was born, like normal life for me as a, as a baby was like the baseball life, right? Like the going to stadiums, the eating concession stand foods, the living out of a suitcase, going from city to city. That was like normal. Right. So like, I mean, granted, like I was like one to what, seven or eight years old, you know, but it's like, that was like what I was born into. And, um, and that's where honestly it became like my passion, uh, because I think it was just the normal life for me. And yeah. uh, I love that life. And then when my dad retired, it was like, okay, well, now I have to make that lifestyle like mine, you know? And it was like, I, I, I got to do that by any means necessary. And it was the only thing I knew. So I was like somewhat good at it. <laughs> were, were you always focused on being a pitcher or was there a position you played? Oh, man, we talk about this a lot, too. Like the whole pitcher only, like the, the yeah. PO dynamic, right? Like everyone yeah. talks about it. It's like, no, man, like I was just a ball player, right? Like. Yeah you grew up like my dad was a catcher right so like uh just the the whole position player lifestyle that was like something i was always like turned on uh for but my dad like again i was super fortunate to have him um but uh he saw the starting pitching lifestyle and like he saw the way that those guys went about their job and he said like that's the best job in the world right you pitch once in every five days and then you're chilling you know and it was like I want that for my son. The only thing I will say that I was mad at him for was he didn't make me left-handed. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> everyone says I act like a left-hander, but I'm not. <laughs> so growing up, where, when did you, uh, where did you go to um, high school for high school ball? So, yeah. So like, that was the whole thing was, um, so when my dad got done playing, you know, the conversation was with my, my mom and him was like, where do you, where do you want to raise the children? Because they were both from small town where now I am, Cloverdale, California, small town, Northern California, Sonoma County, yeah. wine country, big identity crisis. Cause you have like wine country, you have the redwoods, you have like all these, you know, the, the weed capital, of the world's up North. And like, they have all these like different personalities, like all trying to match. So it explains why I'm so weird. But, um, but yeah, so like they were, the conversation was, you know, how, where do you want to raise them? Cause it was like, they kind of lived everywhere. It spent a lot of time on the East coast with my dad being in Detroit, uh, with the tigers and then getting traded to the Red Sox. Um, so I spent a lot of time on the East coast in Florida. And then they were just like, no, let's raise them, you know, where we grew up. So small town, Cloverdale, California, man, like 8,000 people. My graduating class was like, I don't know, 75. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So super small, super small town. I, I, I used to say like every time someone asked me where you're from, I'd say like small town, Cloverdale, California, we only have two stoplights, but we just got three more stoplights in town, man. So we're freaking moving on up. We got a Starbucks now. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's, where I, that's where I grew up. Right. So I got the small town perks and the small town vibe and um, got to learn kind of that way. And then Holy smokes. This is going to be such a long episode. If we're diving into my whole story. This is great. Was, oh, it, was, it, was your dad, up. was your dad like a celebrity back home in a small town like that? So yeah. So it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause I know him as just dad. Like he's just, he, of course. Like, I, well, I'm asking uh, that. I just, yeah. I just bought a property up in a place called Savo beach. It's a little, um, a little community with a little beach house for the fam. And my next door neighbor is an ex NHLer, and he grew up there. 
and it's a small little community. And this guy is like a superstar. Like everybody knows him. Everybody wants to be yeah. around him and stuff like that. Yeah, so yeah. was that, was that similar? Yeah. Now you, now you can, now as an adult, you look back, was that similar? Right. Yeah. So like, I didn't know it at the time. Right. Like, and when we moved back, I think I moved back um, when I was in second grade, I believe. Yeah. Right. So I just knew him as like, hey, that's, just, that's just dad. Like I knew there was something different about it because I had to do that whole dynamic of moving schools kind of often, yeah. you know, in my yeah. childhood. So I knew yeah. there was like something different. Um, but yeah, like, so this is where he's from. Right. So he went to, he went to high school here, played three sports, you know, was an all state basketball player, all state football player actually went to college to play football. Originally his story is more unique than mine. So like, he didn't play baseball right out of high school. Um, kind of like got kicked off the high school team or something like small town, like kind of hick vibes, right, with him. And uh <laughs> didn't didn't cut it going to he went to like Ventura College to try to play football. It didn't happen. He went uh, and then worked in the woods as a as a tree fall, a lumberjack in it, dude. And he just was super content with his life. Then then like rekindled with my mom and then was playing in like a beer league merchant ball league and a, a junior college coach saw him playing this league and was like you should come out to play for my junior college which was mendocino college at the time and uh and he was like i don't think so then my mom was like no you better freaking go and play dude like you're only young once and so it was my mom's persuasion that influenced my dad's decision to go play he went to college one year broke all these records got drafted the tiger 17th round ended up like not knowing at the time but the scout faked his age because he didn't go to college right after high school. Right. So everyone thought it was 19 or something like that, but he was actually like 21 or 22. So they said he was like, all this stuff. That's, dude, that's, that's, it. We, crazy. We, that's, that's some Dominican stuff happening there. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it was <laughs> like, I, I, I like, cause I never knew this until I actually got older and they actually like explained the whole system, like the whole thing to me. Yeah. Um, because I was always confused. I'd look at, I have some, I look at like one of his cards and his card said his birth year was 97 or uh, 67. Yeah. And I'm like, he was born in 64. Why does it say that? <laughs> and that was the whole thing was that like the scout that signed him or maybe it was the college coach or something like that yeah. was like, no, he's, he's 19. And they didn't know it at the time. And they just rolled with it. And um, so, yeah. And it, we have the script the sports center recording, I think somewhere on VHS of Chris Berman, like breaking the news on sports center when my dad was with the Red Sox. Cause they had like a beat writer, like come to our high school and like, like who's this rich rolling guy. Cause in 94 before the strike, he was kind of killing it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then the whole thing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So yeah. But, but back to the question. Yeah. So it was um, like, you know, everyone knew him. And then it was cool because like everyone that he went to school with had kids around the same time and so then i went to school with all of like yeah. their sons right so it was like this whole generational thing yeah. and we were super small school like i said we were like division five in california but like when it came to sports especially basketball like powerhouse dude like seriously this, huh? like kind of small town like did you did you yeah, play like basketball so that i was a basketball player all you like were huh? i know we started the show by talking about my passion for baseball but yeah like uh the, i was i was going to college for two sports yeah okay that that's news i didn't know i had no clue about that what position did you play yeah yeah you point, were you a point uh, guard i was like a point guard yeah point guard shooting guard center yeah because like we uh my high school we were just um you know, we run the dribble drive. So it was like, we didn't really have <laughs> positions. It was kind of yeah, just yeah, like yeah. everyone, you know, but yeah, yeah. It says it, uh, I think on one of my cards, it says it like, uh, on the back of it, like my uh, decision to turn down, um, basketball too. was like, Oh, nice. Now I got, now I got that to show to my kids. <laughs> so in high school, so you, you did the four, the four years of high school, you got drafted right out of high school, correct? Yeah. Yeah. 2010. Did you have any mindset, like, was this a family decision or did you have any mindset of your parents pushing you to go to college? Like, where was your mindset with that? Are you ready to unlock your full potential? I want to introduce you to the Fit, Healthy, and Happy podcast, a powerful resource to transform your life today with expert interviews, 
practical tips, and inspiring stories, this podcast is your roadmap to lasting wellness. Here's what a listener has to say. I used to struggle with my health, but this podcast changed everything. It's like having a personal trainer, nutritionist, and life coach totally for free. With over 2,000 five-star reviews, we're a podcast you can trust. The Fit, Healthy, and Happy Podcast. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, like looking back at it now that I'm older, it, I wit. I don't want to say I wish. I don't live like a life of regrets or anything. Like, I don't no, you can't, really you can't, anything. You but can't. You can't. I love that. You can't. You can't, right? No, like no, it kind of eats no, you up. And yeah, no. so like. I don't look at it like that, but the question that I often get, obviously being kind of somewhat uh, stereotyped with like a draft bust, right. Is like, do you wish you went to college? And the, the thing that I'll say is like, to be completely honest, dude was like, I didn't even explore the idea of being a college student because ever since I think it was my like sophomore year in high school. Now I would say like, after the area code games in my junior year, it was like, I knew I was like, whatever I got to do, like this dream of mine to be a, just a baseball player or reality, I'm going to do it. Right. Yeah. The idea of just, all right, I'm waking up and I'm a ball player. I don't worry about anything else. And I just get to play baseball. Like, I mean, shoot, that was the idea ever since I was, you know, freaking one year old. Right. Um, but then the whole basketball thing, like threw a huge wrench in it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think looking back just because of, uh, you know, the, the struggles, I guess I, th- that I'd say I had early in my career, there was so much more that I had to learn. And that was the downside. It's where we can kind of segue into like the downside of small town and small school is yeah. the competition, right? So yeah. although I grew up playing against really good competition with like my brother's age, group, I always played like three years ahead of mine. But when it came to high school and facing like high school baseball competition, it was just, you know, not the same. And, uh, and that's probably one of those things that affected me. So when people ask me about like the whole like college dynamic, that's one thing that I, I could say, cause I was learning how to fail when I was in professional baseball and I had never failed before. And so learning how to fail on the fly in pro, you know, it's, it's just kind of so, tough. So, okay, let's go back. So you got drafted what round, what team? Let's just for the audience to get to, that doesn't know your story. You got drafted what round, what team? Yeah. So I was third round. I was 88th overall um, by the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. So third round, you said. Yeah. Third round. Okay. So you yeah. went the next year, you're 18, I'm assuming going into spring training just to, I guess you were called into spring training at 18. Yeah. So yeah. So it was actually rare what we did. And this is another really cool part of the story slash journey is so my brother three years older than me, right? So he never applied himself in school. So he got stuck with like the junior college and then the NAIA route, but he was 21 when I was 18 and he was, you know, he got drafted out of high school by the Rockies and he was on the draft board again for that 2010 year. And we had the same agent. So it was like one of those, we did it what was called a brother deal at the time. I don't even know if they do this anymore, but we did a brother deal to where like, I would agree to sign for like the slot because that was back in the old draft where, you know, yeah. people, the high school kids would typically hold out all summer and get paid billions of dollars. <laughs> and I didn't care about money at the time. Dude. I was freaking oblivious. I was just like, I just want to throw baseballs. Let's go. So I was like, yeah, dude, brother deal. So what it was, was like, I agreed to a certain amount of money. It was like the slot. And then uh, the team would agree to sign my brother as like the free agent deal. And then would, um, so my brother just had to like call the teams I was on the draft board with and just say like, don't draft me. I'm going to sign free agent to the Diamondbacks. So we both went to the, the Arizona and we both went to, at the time was rookie ball in the Pioneer League in Missoula, Montana. So we both got to play on the same team that first year. So I signed early, obviously, because I wanted to just like right after I graduated high school, I went left, played, right? That was the whole idea. It was like, I really wanted to just be a ball player, man. So I was like, like, I don't care about money. Let's go. Here we go. And uh, yeah, so he, we played that first season together. He tore it up. He had a way better year than I did. What position did he play? Running joke. What position? Well, he was a catcher. 
he was a he's a catcher uh you know like like pops and he actually caught my professional debut debut how so cool is that, that i have that memory how uh, cool oh my is gosh, that june 30th do you guys have, you, 30th, do you, have do you have it on do you have that on video oh gosh yeah yeah that's pretty, it's pretty it's like, pretty special like that's that's one of those things well, you my could... mom and dad made the trip yeah yeah that's pretty that's pretty cool as a parent i mean that's pretty that's pretty mm. special right Oh my gosh, the outing wasn't special. I'll be honest, <laughs> <laughs> but the the memory, the memory was very special. Yeah, I re- and I wish at the time I knew what was happening, and I look back at it as I'm older and having more experience in this game. At the time, it was just like, oh, you know, my brother Richie's catching me again. We grew up playing together. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it was just kind of like another, it was just like another game. But now it's like every year that passes is another kind of recollection i guess of of just how like special that moment was and yeah. how much like we got to kind of like i mean that's cool like right like how many how many how many people get to say that that's that's really, it's very rare that's really i mean cool. I it's very very was. rare yeah very very rare yeah and just the bare fact yeah. you're a catcher i mean you get guys play on the same team even that's still pretty right. rare i mean uh who's the, who are the guys right. right now for the uh for the cleveland the catcher and his brothers on the team too or i don't know if he was on the playoff roster but uh, he's a Canadian, Mississauga, Ontario. He's the one that hit the home run and did the whole baby rocking for uh, Derek. Cole. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Him and his uh, brother. N- N- uh, N- Nyler. Nyler. Yeah. Nyler. That was pretty Josh, crazy. Josh N- Nyler. 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 That's Nyler. it. And his brother is on the team, team too. I think they're both catcher. I mean, his brother's a catcher too, I think. I didn't know his brother was on the team. Yeah. I, the, yeah, his brother's on the team. And they the, both, they're both from cool Mississauga, Ontario. The... Oh, Okay. The cool one is uh the the Nola brothers. So you have uh Aaron yeah. Nola, the Phillies, who's yeah. shoving, and then you have Austin Nola, the catcher for the Padres. Yeah, like they're gonna yeah. meet, right? Yeah, they, yeah, they play yeah, 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 yeah. That's gonna be that's gonna be cool. So I'm gonna just ask you one quick question about your brother, and then I want to go back to you. Um, your brother's career, how far did he go to did he get to the majors? No, so that was like that was my first understanding of the political side of professional baseball because i didn't know that about that when i got in 18 years old right yeah and then i realized like holy smokes this isn't fair he batted 300 his first year came back spring training got released and i was like wait what and then you start to realize like oh it's because they invested x amount of money in these guys and these guys and then you just get to this point where like it's not about like how good you are it's about how much they paid because you know and that's just the way it is. No knock on any organization, but I completely understand in terms of, you know, you make it a pretty substantial investment in somebody. You want to see them through and give them multiple opportunities. And then the guys you don't give a whole lot of investment to, like, sorry, you know, yeah. and I and I get it now. But at the time, it was just like, all right, so now you're telling me that I'm going to go out and perform in this organization for this organization. Just that just kind of like, yeah. It's just like cut my brother, like screwed over too, right? Like yeah. it's not like he was a, a scrub, didn't have a, you know, he had like one of the better years on that on that team, and that was a tough tough one for me to swallow because that was kind of when I was going through this whole like kind of rechanging of my identity to where eighteen years old, like my ish don't stink, dude. I just got drafted, right? Like I'm I'm chilling, I'm I'm good, and then nineteen, I come back and uh, I realize like man, I went from being a big fish in a little pond to a little fish in a huge pond, you know? And it was kind of just whole, like my world's kind of starting to flip upside down. And, uh, you know, there's a lot going on. And that's just the whole part of like, as an athlete, the the maturing process. But it was tough because, you know, I'm... Sorry, when you go look back, and, and what I'm going to ask is, I was just, it was crazy. Me and my, me and my, my son were watching yesterday. We started watching, we got through two episodes of the new Jeter um, on apple tv uh they have a doc series on jeter and it shows him right out of high school in the first year year and a half he struggled like really struggled yeah mentally were you more prepared because of your dad or you were less prepared because you thought it was just an easier ride like how how was that pressure on yourself mentally at that point right because i mean obviously the anxiety the stress is there because you have to perform but how were you mentally yeah. So like, I would say the mental hurdle was like the biggest hurdle. Um, yeah. Like I said earlier, I was, it was like, I know people that maybe don't know baseball kind of get confused when this is said, but I had to learn how to fail and I never had failed before. And what that means is just like, 
understanding that there's this process in which you have to kind of go through that is just the game. The game is built on failure. And I knew that because I obviously like dad would, you know, prepare me for that mentally, but I didn't ever go through that because physically I was just more, I was just more better. I was just better, right. Than a lot of like the competition growing up. Um, and that's, and that's kind of the same dynamic as a lot of high school kids that, that get drafted, right. Is like, they're just better, they're just better than, you know, their, their, their talent pool at the time. And then, so for me, the learning of how to fail was just more of a process to be like, okay, what can I control within this, this work day? What can I control? Um, and then what can't I control? And for me, I've, I've always been somebody that hates to lose more than he loves to win. So when I'd freaking get, you know, punched in the jaw, it was hard for me to kind of bounce back and, and just trust that process of, you know, the consistent improvement. Um, because I kind of was in this idea of like, I wanted to see instant results, right. Instead of just seeing it more in a big picture in which everyone always kind of talks about when you're an 18 year old or 19 year old kid in a system, everyone always talks about the big picture and talks about your process and projectability where it was me, you know, I had so much success early on that I just got accustomed to that. And so when it stopped altogether, the success stopped altogether, you know, as a perfectionist, it was hard for me to kind of, you know, uh, I guess, trust my preparation, trust my process moving forward. Like, is this actually working? Like, is am I actually doing this the right way? Do I need to drastically change? So then you get into this whole concept of, uh, you know, identity and foundation yeah. and, yeah. and this, this whole, you know, okay, well, if this isn't working, you know, do we got to reinvent the wheel? And the hardest thing for me at that time, man, was, I was 19 years old. I've always been a people pleaser and I've, I've identified that now as I've gotten older yeah. and I was around so many coaches that just wanted to help. And I was trying to be a sponge, you know, I was trying to consume everyone's information or everyone's, you know, 10 or two cents, um, what they had, you know, for me to improve. And what happened was now I just completely lost you know, who I was and what made me good in the first place. And I'm trying to be somebody else. I'm trying to change each and every day because I'm not content with, you know, uh, who I was at the time. And that's where we can kind of get into that fine line of like contentment and complacency and consistency, right? Yeah, where yeah. as a ball player, you know, you got to have some sense of foundation of knowing who you are, what you do well, and then knowing those little fine pieces of your, of your game that you know, can use improvement without reinventing Inventing the, the wheel. system. Yeah. So that was really hard for me to navigate at the time. And, you know, the, the mental struggles of, of everything where it's like, now you start talking about, shoot, I was 88th overall. I'm having all this struggles, you know, like I'm supposed to be good. I thought I was good. There's a lot that goes on, you know, <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking back at it now, I don't even think I realized at the time what I was actually going through. I just knew it sucked and I wanted to wanted it to change. Right. But I feel like that's just that's life. Right. You go through things and you don't quite know how to respond to what you're going through and you do the best you can with the information that you have. And then like five years goes by in a blink of an eye and you look back at it and you go, oh, I learned how to do this in that process. Or I learned I learned how to be this guy. And now I'm better equipped now to potentially help somebody else in their journey, you know, and and so super grateful for everything I've gone through. It sucked at the time, but, uh, you know, that's every, every, everything's a lesson, right? I mean, uh, everything we go through in life is a lesson. You have to take it as that. And, 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 and obviously you've turned into, I mean, all the learning curves you've done and you've turned into being able to utilize that in, into teaching and helping others, which is incredible. Cause a lot of guys will, will know a craft, know an art, but know it for themselves, not know how to reflect oh, and yeah. turn it around to something else. And that's, if it, it feels like, it's like, where you are in your career right now, it's like most, I would say most major league pitchers when they're in their forties and fifties and they can sit back and just watch on TV and they're reflecting on watching other people. Mm -hmm. Now they can start putting these motions together, these actions together, this process together to help others. And you figured it out quite young. You're still quite yeah. young. So thanks, man. I needed that. Let's talk about, let's talk about, there's a, I'm going to go in a whole bunch of directions here. I just want to dive into yeah. quickly 
minor leagues. And why we talk about this because we've had locally um i'm part of the board of um of uh, baseball for brampton here and and we've had a, a handful of kids uh young guys get drafted and um one of them got drafted um in the cub system exact same kind of scenario pitcher came up team canada supposed to be the next stud uh went one year uh was playing in uh, myrtle beach pelicans if i'm mistaken which is their single a um ended up going to uh double a had a cup of tea actually had a great run in double a thought he had his best season and then it was cut. And then it was a process oh, of just it, playing independent ball for a few years, played yeah, for Team yeah. Canada, uh, played up front Team Canada for another four or five times, uh, went to Brazil, traveled, like made the use, made the most of his opportunity. Yeah. And uh, now he's now he's actually a high school teacher, a local guy. He coaches some kids. He's a high school teacher, went back to school. But I, I look back and I see, and, I, and when I talk to him about um, the minor league grind, um, hotels, yeah microwave food just let's let's talk about yeah. the reality because people think i'm drafted and, and now i've made it and they don't understand yeah single a double yeah. a even triple a some people at triple a how hard it is the road trips the the, the motels yeah. the bunking with other guys in the room the 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 quality of food and you trying to build the off season a lot of these guys are paying for their yeah. own training their own stuff off season let's talk a little bit about the grind before you get to where you want to get to and how hard it is and the reality of it all is yeah yeah I, well, i've heard like i heard triple a is actually the worst because they got to do the planes they got to do the plane flights you know yeah. at the 2 a.m yeah. um but all right so i'll preface all this by saying like i was very fortunate right so i was very fortunate to be able to go into the minor league grind with you know a little bit of money from from my signing bonus okay when i hear stories of like how my mom and dad went through it all with two kids and like what they had i mean that's that's the grind like i it's always funny like i'm the worst person to ask about the minor league grind because a like i said like i was i was fortunate i was like financially stable i didn't have to worry like about you know oh i have to i can't eat today because i you know i don't have any money or whatever very fortunate and then uh and then b i was just love this freaking game you know like the game itself trumps anything i have to do yeah any bus ride i have to get on to play it it's it's like a running joke you know when uh we have like a long bus ride even now like last season right so i'm 30 and last season we had like a 10 hour bus ride everyone's just freaking all pissed off you know and i'm just sitting up there like a kid in the candy store 18 year old rob still like just loving <laughs> it like this is it man you got but you guys gotta understand like you know this is what i was born into and it's just like every it's it's what i knew it's what i know um and I've had the I've been also super fortunate to have this game taken away from me on multiple occasions, whether it be an injury or, or whether it be, you know, being released from a team that now I've shifted my mindset into being just way more, you know, grateful for every opportunity that I get. So whatever comes with that, like it's better than the alternative. It's better than not doing it. Right. Yeah. So I think, again, going back to the whole life, you know, everything that you go through is a lesson. And if you are mindful and attentive to the things that life is throwing at you, you can learn and obtain a lot of information, you know, to better yourself and better individuals around you. But yeah, the grind is tough, man. And like, I mean, shoot, there's, there's, uh, I think the longest bus ride I've ever been on is, is 14 hours. My first year we had a bus ride. Uh, we were going from Missoula, Montana, Wyoming ended up getting stuck on a freaking mountaintop because there was like construction <laughs> that we had to play the not that next night we got in at like 4 30 no one slept but you know you're going to hotel you're going to the motel six my first road trip of professional baseball is to motel six helena montana cockroaches on the floor I'm walking into the room like, let's go, baby. We made it. You know, <laughs> let's do it. Everyone's just like, what the heck? Because a lot of guys, you got to realize, like, are coming from D1 colleges, right? Yeah, and their yeah. life was pretty luxury, right? Like, yeah. I, you know, that first year, I had a couple of guys from, you know, Oklahoma, South Carolina, um, Florida State, where they're, like, taking chartered flights, you know, yeah, getting yeah. good meal money. And now it's like, holy smokes, you know, freaking this is ain't it but you know it gets better shoot man i was talking to somebody the other day about it how it's crazy how much in just a decade things have changed so 
you know, when my dad was playing and when I heard stories of the minor leagues, it was like, holy smokes, this is tough, right? You watch Bull Durham and you're like, yeah. oh man, like 20 <laughs> bucks, I can get us a rain out, you know, we need it. And nowadays, you know, like I played indie ball this last year and we're going to freaking cathedrals and we're getting freaking good post game spread. We went to Canada, you know, play uh, Quebec and it's like the post game dinner is a freaking like five star meal. And we're just like, holy smokes, this is this ain't supposed to be indie ball, right? Yeah. Like, and it's just crazy how things are evolving now that we are taking recognition into how just grindful the minor league lifestyle is, especially with the pay, right? There's, there's, uh, there's people kind of taking charge on, on trying to change that for the betterment of the athletes, right? Cause I think just the overall desire maybe to play the sport is probably down maybe due to something like that people don't want to probably go through that so i think they're doing a better job now trying to compensate guys more and make it a little bit more appealing but um but do you, yeah do, do, do you think that's there's that is the difference from you talk about somebody from north america that comes from a comfy home that comes from a comfy background that's never needed nothing and then going to struggle in the minors to you get a guy from South America that had nothing. And now yeah. their, their mission is just to get everything they can. So yeah, they yeah. have a different path, the understanding oh, of man. where it is. It is. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I think, I don't think it's all of that, right? Like I think there's a lot of other intangibles, but hundred percent, man. Like when you think about what, um, and I'm not saying every like American is like this, right. But you look yeah. at the differences between the Latin Americans that play and the Americans that play, it's two totally different styles, right. Whereas like the Americans, they grew up and it was like kind of more of a, don't do this, don't do that type. Yeah. And then the Latin Americans, they play, they got all this flair and flash, but all it is, is just joy. Right. Cause yeah. like, yeah, they're playing this game that they grew up just loving and they're going to show that passion. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you start talking about American baseball and it's kind of like there's these unwritten rules, right? Like I grew up with a dad that played in the 90s. So it was kind of like, don't do that. Don't hit a homer and show your guy up. And it's like, that's kind of the more of the physical side of it. But like, yeah, for sure. Going to the other other component of that is you get put in these situations where as an American or whatever, as a somebody that had a comfortable lifestyle, you put in these situations where now all of a sudden off the field, you're not comfortable, which will then lead into you not being comfortable in performance, right? Because your preparation is maybe thrown off. I'll never forget, like, you know, my second year, it was, uh, it was kind of similar to that. And I'm, I'm not one to like, complain about a living situation or whatever. But it was like, we had a two bedroom apartment with six to eight dudes sleeping on air mattresses. And at the time, I'm 19. So I wake up in the morning, I feel okay, like every day, but you don't realize how course of a season like that takes a toll on yeah. you right like you know there's there's things you're not eating the right food you're you're you know kind of you're grinding in that sense you know eating late eating fast food because you can't cook because you know whatever yeah. living conditions aren't good and uh maybe it's the first time you're kind of thrown into that so now on the field you your performance suffers whereas like maybe from other you know, other people, other, other individuals that play the game had a different kind of upbringing. Maybe it was very similar to that. So they're, that's just all they know. And now yeah. they get thrown into it. You know, I see the same thing with guys that uh, get drafted and, and leave home for the first time in a while, right? Like it's, it's uncomfortable yeah. and whether they like it or not, like that uncomfort will then influence performance. A hundred percent. So yeah, for sure. The first time you were released or cut what, mm. what, what, what or release cut same thing or injured yeah like that any the first time that you were pushed away from what you love doing at a pro level when was it um so that's interesting so in 12 i was traded so 12 so, i was traded from the diamondbacks to, the, to pittsburgh and that, that was kind that of is weird. after is that after two years give or take yeah so i was yeah so i spent 10 11 and then spring training of 12 i got traded at the last day of spring training pittsburgh that was a weird dynamic it was like kind of whoa like okay i guess that team that drafted me didn't want me and it was kind of a weird situation as it is so just like real quick when i got drafted i was drafted by you know the front office of x individuals right and then the next year everyone got fired 
So it was like everyone that wanted me in that organization was gone. 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 And it was like new, it was new front office. So yeah. it was kind of weird as it is. Um, but yeah, 12, I was traded and it was like, A, on, on one hand, it was like, that's the organization that drafted me now. You know, they don't want me. Got it. But on the other hand, it was like, I just spent two years kind of struggling, right? Grinding to find an identity. Yeah. The best thing for a ball player is a start, like a new start, right? Yeah. New scenery, new everything. Like go be the person that you want to be instead of the person that you're, you're grinding, trying to change, you know, in that system. So I was like super excited when it happened. It sucked having to go from like Arizona spring training to Florida spring training. Yeah. But uh, that's when like my career kind of started to shift as well. How to like a reinvent myself, the change of scenery really helped. And then spent 12, 13, 14 with Pittsburgh. And then so the first time that I got released and cut from a team that said like, hey, you're not good for us, totally different mental state was 2014. Um, so 2014 of August, August of 2014, I was in, this is where we start getting to the point in my career where it was a lot of like mental struggles, right? Yeah. Because I thought like I had seen success at that point, 2012, I'd say it was one of my better years. And it was like, all right, now we're starting to piece things together. And I was still 21 at the time. Yeah. So it was like, you're young, dude. Like for a picture, very we, young. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that was the whole upside of, of getting drafted at 18 and signing, right? It was yeah. like, you get thrown in. Yeah. You're probably going to struggle early on. But you're gonna have a good window now okay. to to you know get second chances and whatnot. So kind of like now we were working our way up and then got hit with this 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 mental kind of maybe trying to be somebody that I was not trying to do more, trying to impress and all these kind of things that I had struggled with early on, but now I was on a different level because I was at a higher, higher league, you know, and um so went through this whole struggle, struggled with like, you know, you're a baseball guy. So like the yips, right? Like that's yeah. a huge dynamic yeah. in, in any sport, right? Like where you just, you're known for doing something and then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you just physically can't do that one thing. I, 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 was, I was this weekend, I was just binge watching with my, with my, with my wife, Ted Lasso. I don't know if you ever watched those. And when he says the word, oh, yips, I he's heard like, it was great. He's like, he goes, oh, such a good show. Such a good show. And, and, and as a show, they got a sports psych in to help the team. And she goes, they do, it's the yip and they, all the them are like don't say that word don't say that word so it's don't say, a word. say that <laughs> it's, but it's the worst right like because yeah. as an alpha male right like yeah. as an athlete the last thing you want to admit is that you're yeah. dealing with some mental stuff right like yeah. mental health and this is why honestly this is a huge reason of why i started what i started it online and and with my brand because I've went through it, man. I went, th I went through the ringer. Right. And as yeah. I said before, like I've always been a people pleaser. So what happened was I was like, so fixated on trying to please others and, and like focused on my external environment as opposed to like internally. Right. Yeah. Like I, I, I wasn't trying to please myself. And next thing you knew, it was like, who am I? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. what am I doing, man? I, I'm trying to change who I am every single day to please that guy. And then I'm trying to do this because he told me to do that, this and that. And when you're struggling in the game, that's what you try to do, right? You try to please other people like your coaching staff by uh, like working with them and like trying to obtain new information and just trying to like, you know, be a sponge. Um, but when you're performing really well and like things are good, no one touches you, no. right? Like that's just the dynamic of professional sports. And um, so when I was going through this mental stuff, man, it was like, I was trying to do anything and everything to like, still like, you know, be, uh, be looked at as somebody that, <laughs> that was acceptable on our team, you know, and it's embarrassing when you go through it. Cause shoot, you're freaking known to do one thing of throw this dang ball, like where you want it. And then you go out and perform and I'll never forget my last outing. I threw 15 pitches. I threw 14 balls wow. and it was like, I said it, you know, I said it like, I was like, I'm, I might as well be throwing with the opposite hand. Cause I'm so mentally F right now. Right. Like, I don't know what I'm doing. And so it was cool, man, to see how this all unfolded, like the re getting released because I was like super okay with it. I was like, yeah, I got it. Like, I understand this, right? Like I'm not performing up to my standards, you know, like there's always somebody trying to take your job. And as soon as I got released, I got this like weight off my shoulders and it was like, okay, dude, we started over before. Now it's like, now it's really time to start over and it's not time to start over and change to somebody new it's time to start over and change to the person that got you freaking you know 88th overall 
third round. Like, come on, man. You know, who are we? Let's go find that. So, so, so. let me ask something, Robbie. When, when you're going through that process, was there anybody you could reach out to? Like uh, most teams now, and I'm assuming all teams, even right through the minors, have some type of sports yeah. psychologist working with them because it's 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 so open now. When you were doing yeah. it, was it so close where it was something people still didn't talk about back then? Kind of, but we had a mental conditioning team with Pittsburgh, yeah. and uh, I loved everyone that I worked with. Yeah, I'll be completely honest with you, man. Like it made things worse. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> the only reason I'll say this, and this is why I like doing what I do because I have played and I have kind of experienced this fine line of mental skills, coaching slash time to back off. Yeah. Because I went from somebody that to be honest, man, I didn't know really what I was doing. I just knew I was doing it well. So when it comes to baseball, there's so much simplicity within these yeah. complexities, yeah. right? Yeah, I Trying to that. hit a freaking round ball with a round bat, like moving, going fast. Stuff doesn't make sense. No. But at the like the foundation of the game, it's beautiful. Throw the ball, yeah. hit the ball. Yeah. Right? Like, the there's so much simplicity in that. Yeah. yeah. So what happened was, is like, I knew that there were some struggles, right? Like I knew that I was kind of the, the, the skills of my craft were slipping and I knew it was kind of in between the ears, right. With a confidence aspect, like we can kind of talk about this all day. Like what influences confidence is confidence external motivated, or is it internal? I was struggling with both, right? So when you're struggling, you're not getting a whole lot of external confidence. Obviously you're not going to get internal confidence if you're a perfectionist and you're not seeing the results you want. So. Then it was like, yeah, we got a mental skills team. Perfect. Let's go chat. Next thing you know, it was like, I'm now opening up all of these different questions in my head. What is my pre-pitch routine? What is my breathing routine? What am I focused on? Where's my visualization? Am I, am I breathing through my nose or am I breathing through my mouth or my eyelids or am I like doing this? You know, what? It, and all these things as an 18 year old kid, you would just like throw me the ball and I'd be like, all right, let's go. Let's go to work. Let's go have fun. Right. Like that was my big thing. And then all of a sudden for me internally, the task of throwing the ball became just super over complex. And it used to never be that it was like, okay, I want to throw this pitch right there. I'm just going to do it. And I know I'm going to do it because I've seen myself do it over and over again. And I have fun doing it. Yeah. And then when you struggle, right, it's all of a sudden, holy smokes, this is the hardest thing in the world. How did I ever do this? Right. So that's, I learned a lot of like really cool, like skill acquisition um, concepts from the mental side of it. Yeah. And that's why I don't regret kind of really leaning towards that. Right. So I've always struggled with like ADD and, and all this stuff growing up, but without knowing it, I learned how to target it better when I was a kid because it was just, it was fun. And I targeted thoughts differently. Yeah. And then when I got older and started struggling, now my thoughts were, man, I hope I don't throw this ball, man. I hope I don't freaking give up, you know, all these like very negative connotation thought processes. Yeah. So that was a whole, you know, process in and of itself to go through. But, you know, I said it multiple times, like I needed to go through that to be now better equipped moving forward with potentially somebody else. But man, it sucks at the time. <laughs> so that process, you were 20. How old were you when you got released? 23 or 24? Yeah, I was 22. I was 22. 22. So you're still a baby. Still, still young. Yeah. So give me the understanding from there. You went back home. Did you go back home? Take some time yeah, for yourself? So this, yeah. So this was like the, probably the best thing for me, you know? And that was like best thing for my entire career, to be honest with you. So it's 2014. I get released in August. Right. So that's like, there was only a couple of weeks left in the season. Yeah. So I knew at that time, like, I'm probably not going to latch on with another team to finish the year for a couple of weeks. Like, so I'm not even focused on that. And I'm not even ready for that. I got a couple calls from Indie Ball. Cause I had to drive from where I got released Florida to California yeah. and I called pops and I was like, I'm coming home. We're fixing this stuff. Like we're, you and me are coming back. Like we we're getting back to this. Right? I love it. Yeah. And, um, 
And through my couple of years in pro ball, it was kind of different to be honest. Cause I'd come back and it was like, pops would say something. It'd be like in one ear out the other, right? Like, yeah. nah, you don't know, man, I'm around all these pitching guys all year. Like you were a yeah. catcher and eh, whatever. But growing up, it was like, that was the only guy I had. That was the only guy I listened to. So I call him. I was like, Hey, I'm putting all my ego aside. Like we're getting right. Okay. Like, you know, me better than probably anyone. Like, yeah. let's get this right. Right. So made the trip. So I had, uh, I had this whole plan, like super strategized on how to get back to like my roots. Right. Yeah. And sure enough, man, the thing worked, you know, like the whole idea was like, I need to get out of this idea that I'm a pitcher. I need to get back to that idea that I'm a ball player. I'm an athlete, athlete. and I, pitching is just what I do. Yeah. Right. So like pops, we would freaking we'd take ground balls. We'd take fly balls. We'd do all these st- things that I just did in high school without even realizing it. Right. And got out of this whole like idea behind pitching mechanics and like things like X, Y, Z. And it was like, no, dude, like, I'm just going to throw, I'm going to move. I'm going to enjoy it. And that was the best time in my life because it kind of brought this whole joy of the game back and the process of it. It wasn't a grind anymore. And obviously it helps when like, you know, you start seeing kind of things start to unfold the way you want it to, as opposed to like, man, I'm really struggling, you know? Yeah. So it was a really cool journey for me. Like within three months, you know, I went from like, shoot, when I got released, I was struggling. So I was like, doing like 84, 85. Yeah. Three months I was back up. I was up to like 95, 96. I threw for some scouts. The first time I threw, like the Cardinals were like, we want you. Like you look yeah. great. I signed that day, uh, St. Louis. All I was saying to guys too, it was cool, man. Like I was just like, give me an invite to spring training. Don't even agree to terms with anything. I just want an invite. And, uh, you know, and that's, and like I said, I was 22 turning 23. Yeah. So they gave me an invite to camp. I come to camp and it was minor league camp. No one knew who I was. And I come in and I'm just like, having gone all through what I've gone through, I was just like super happy to be there. Just had a Jersey, you know? Yeah. I was like, I had this so much joy about the game and that influenced like the performance of it. Right. So like I, it was my first time kind of like relieving too. So just started throwing the piss out of the ball, ended up making a squad. I was kind of upset. Like I was, I was going to repeat single a, even though I had been there like three years prior, Yeah. but I was like, at the time, man, I was like, nothing's going to freaking phase me. I was like, give me a job, like, give me a ball. Like, let's go, dude. So that was my best year, like 2015, man, I, in St. Louis, Ended up uh, starting an A ball, moved all the way up to double A by the end of the year, went to the Arizona Fall League, got a big league spring training invite at the end of the year. Like there's so many things that like you look like that's the beauty of baseball, right? That's yeah. the beauty of freaking baseball. That's why like people ask like, well, well, dude, like, why are you still playing? Like you hear these stories about the freaking janitors now in the World Series, you know, he's just like, I had, I had, I, I, had, I, I interviewed uh, Jim Morris on this, on this podcast. Oh I actually talk, I, I talked to him all the time. We actually become friends and he's just uh, an incredible, incredible dude. And yeah, I've talked about a crazy story. Oh, oh my gosh. Isn't that, I mean, that's just beautiful. That's why sports dude, like sports yeah, in yeah. and of itself is just so gorgeous in that, in that regard. How do you, can you not be romantic about it? But you know, it was, yeah, it was cool. So like 2015, you know, it was just great. And it was like, holy smokes, this whole thing worked, right? Like it yeah. really worked like the simplicity of it, right? Like it, it kind of like I went through the ringer, but it was like, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. I kind of know how to do this thing now, you know, like having yeah. known everything I know, you know, up until that point. So I was like, every time I'd go out, you know, it was fixating my thoughts on something different, right? Like, don't worry about the negatives. How can we influence positivity, self-dialogue? We can control that. Let's do it. Like, all right, like change the focal point, change the task instead of, you know, I'm trying to get this hitter out, self-inflict something else. It was for me, it was like, I go out and I literally just say, I'm going to try to throw the ball as hard as I can. And then I'm going to have fun doing it. So I'm out there dancing, you know, doing my thing, you know, and just like, oh gosh, dog it. I was just having fun, you know, and that's where I started to really truly identify that that's what I needed to do. That was me. That was my identity for me to be at my very best. It was for me to just be in complete joy of this game yeah. you know because you get into these systems and you're so focused on like man i i don't want them to not like me right and they they can use any little thing that i do i'll never forget my first like my first two years in in arizona i just i got yelled at for wearing the wrong stirrups or i'm trying to bring attention to myself i had a beard oh we don't like beards and it was all these stupid things and i get it as an organization right like you want to kind of control some aspects of you know <laughs> Uh, appearance but for me i've always been super open flamboyant freaking 
you know, whatever. And it was like, that's who I needed to get back to. And yeah. if, you know, and if no one liked that, to be honest, man, like it was okay because it was, I'm going to be true to who I am. Yeah. You know, and that's like one of my biggest kind of lessons that I learned throughout that process was don't change who you are to please somebody else. Right. Like yeah. stay true to who you are. And yeah. More times than not, if you truly have an identity and you're and you have a good foundation and you're not disrespecting or intentionally disrespecting, you know, everyone around you, then like you're probably going to set yourself up for a little bit better performance, right? Because yeah. there's a sense of comfort that comes with that. So, uh, yeah, man, that 2015 was a, a was a really cool year. And then, you know, moving forward, you know, it was like finally I figured out like all these things and it was like here we go, baby. Like took us a while, but we're here now. Next thing is like big leagues. Look, let's go. And then shoot, I got to big league camp that next year and freaking had to get elbow surgery. <laughs> so that was like one of those things that took me away from the game. That was more injury related. It was the first injury I had to deal with. That was. That was when that injury occurred during the, the, the prior season or was the off season? How'd you, when did you Dude, find it? It was out of nowhere, man. So I was going to spring training. It was my first big league camp. Yeah. And, uh, I was still home. And I literally like went to throw one day and literally just couldn't like, I didn't know what it was. It was like, okay, I'm going to take a day off. But you also got to realize like it was, I think I was like a week away from showing up to camp. Yeah. So I was like, okay, I'm maybe take two days off, took two days off, went to throw. I was like, I can't throw. And then I started like looking at my elbow in the mirror and stuff and realized like I can't even straighten my arm. I can't even bend my arm and it started just getting worse and worse every day. I never dealt with an injury physically. Yeah. <laughs> before. Um, so I was like, okay, I was stuck between a rock and a hard place. Cause it was like, do I call St. Louis? And do I say, Hey, I know it's four days before I showed up to my first big league camp, but you know, I can't straighten my arm or do I just show up to big league camp and try to see if it, you know, works as well goes away yeah which is crazy yeah yeah so ended up calling them and they were great through this whole process honestly like i i give a lot of credit to the st louis organization because it was like all right no say less we're getting you on a flight we're gonna fly you to st louis get you your mri x-ray we'll go from there so it turns out like i had like bone spurs bone chips that were like Jamming. lodged in us yeah. yeah they were lodged in a certain place that like Cause you hear guys all the time that have them and throw, but yeah, mine yeah. got like stuck in a yeah. certain spot. That yeah. They're, they're loose in there. So it all depends yeah, on yeah. loose bodies. Yeah. So, so they gave me an option. Actually, they were like, all right, do you get the surgery? Um, you obviously miss, you know, X amount of time, or do you just rehab it? Because a lot of guys will just rehab it and then it'll go away. And I was like, shoot, man, like I could very much be, you know, making my debut at the end of this year i want to make sure that this thing's cleaned up you know so yeah. i don't have that even just mentally i don't have that yeah. in the back yeah. of my head you know so i was like all right let's clean it up and they were like it's a microscopic surgery it'll be fine you know you give it uh i think they said i think they said four to eight weeks and i'd be back and i'm like oh that's cake that's cake right like yeah. as opposed to the alternative of what it potentially could be when we're talking about the elbow yeah um so i get the surgery there was this big miscommunication, which is super unfortunate about how much time I was supposed to be spent in the sling, dude, this is like bad. So there, uh, they flew me home the day after surgery and they were super great. Like they flew my mom out to take care of me. Cause you know, yeah. as a 23 year old, I can't take care of myself. <laughs> so flew my mom out, take care of me, flew me back home. And I was actually kind of hoping that they would just, you know, take me to camp. And so I could be around the guys, you know, have a, you know, work out there and, yeah. and rehab there. They flew me home and they kind of went dark for instructions and they were just like, all right, sling two weeks cake. So apparently with the surgery that I had, like the microscopic surgery, you're supposed to get out of the sling within the next day and you're supposed to start challenging your range of motion. I didn't dude. I, they, they told me sling like two weeks. They, they didn't really give me any instructions. So the, the scar tissue, like the stuff started, started to heal, heal. Oh. as I'm in the sling. Yeah. So I don't know if you can see, but like now that's as much as I can straighten my arm. So I have a 35 degree difference. So and, like, you, and you were never able to work, like have a massage therapist work that sling, that, that, that so scar when I, tissue. So, dude. So I finally ended up calling them after like two weeks and was like, Hey, 
I can't straighten my arm. <laughs> they, they told me that I'd be able to straighten it or whatever after two weeks. And I was like, Hey, I can't straighten." So they, they flew me to spring training like right away. And, uh, we tried to do, you know, the physical therapy, but in my eyes, it, you know, that's something that it was too know, late. It was, yeah. It was like you know, oh. one of those things where, so this is where that, that surgery that should have been very simple, not simple. I should, I shouldn't word it that way. I preface this all by saying like, I never blame anyone, right? Like surgical procedures, like sometimes yeah. they just, they just happen, you know, yeah, things yeah. happen and, and whatever. So the unfortunate thing that, that came about all this was that, that four to eight week window that I was supposed to come back turned into like five months, you know? Oh. So I was down five months. So I, I, I didn't come back till like July and I had to relearn how to throw a baseball because, because of is the angle now. Yeah. So like oh. I was internally rotating my shoulder earlier because I couldn't get full elbow yeah, extension. Yeah. Yeah. So like yeah. when I, when I came back throwing, I was like, something's wrong. Like this ain't right. I yeah. would throw dude. And like, it feels super weird, you know, like I'd get super inflamed, um, you know, because it was like kind of bone on bone again, yeah. rubbing, rubbing. And always. Was just, yeah. Oh man, it was weird. So, um, unfortunately it took five months, but learned a lot through that right because that was my first time actually in like a physical like rehab setting learning how to kind of uh, navigate that in such a way that is still positive even though it's a very negative environment but um and then when i when i came back you know they they sent me on some rehab assignments i was super worried at first because it was like i'd throw and then i'd wake up the next day and i'd be like oh my gosh i didn't want to touch a baseball i was so sore you know and and uh that was hard for me because I had never been somebody that, that got hurt. Right. Like I've always prided or, myself or, or, on, were you open with that? Or were you hiding that, that pain? Were you like, I honestly, I was on a one year deal. Right. So I was like trying to hide it, um, yeah. in such a way that like, I didn't want to be like, Hey, I can't throw. How was your, how was your velocity? Year. How was your velocity? So my velocity one day would be like 88, 90. The next day it could be, you know, up to 95, 97, like it was so weird, like the constant fluctuation, it was all just dependent on how it was feeling, how inflamed right? it was. Uh, oh man. Yeah. yeah. And it would get uh, worse and it would, you know, I get down to like 25 degrees and then one day it would be back up to 35 degrees. So honestly, like it was a direct correlation to how much range of motion my elbow had yeah. to influence my velocity. Right. Yeah. So that's part, that part of it kind of stunk, but, um, you know, I finished out the year pretty strong. They sent me back to double A and um, started just trying to get used to this sensation and this feeling and all these kind of things that came about with it. And um, that's my first year that, uh, you know, I, I was like, I need to go get innings because I just missed five months of the year. So I went, that was my first year going to winter ball in Puerto Rico. So it's cool how everything works out, man. You know, you look at it like that was such a negative thing. But if I had a full season there, I would have never opened the doors to my, my winter ball experience in which I go to Puerto Rico now, like every winter. You do, you huh? know, to go I, play. You're, you're going oh, now, yeah. you're going, you're going this next week, correct? Yeah. I'm, I'm going in a week. Yeah. 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 So I go over there and like, that was such a cool opportunity for me, you know? And, and, um, so like, I think like the second day that I was there, I actually got a call from St. Louis that they were like, Hey, we want to bring you back. Like, we're going to pay you more. <laughs> we're going to, you know, send you to big league camp again. And I was like, Holy smokes, like kind of surprising. Right. So like, that was cool in terms of like, what what provides confidence externally like that yeah, was one of, of those things where like oh yeah. they they like me this was like kind of a new dynamic for me right like i was in two organizations prior to that that i felt didn't like me yeah <laughs> so yeah. that was cool right so i spent all all winter there and then uh so 2017 that's kind of where you know i'm trying to navigate this elbow thing and it's just a whole new system to kind of really figure out and and um you know start to incorporate protocols like there was all new things that i had to do like i'd have to wake up every morning and just start to challenge elbow extension just so it wouldn't inflame and i had to sleep differently you know all of these things man i can't even lay down now without like my arm just like being hung up in the air kind of it's kind of weird there were certain pitches that i can't even throw anymore like what you know like i couldn't throw a, so a curveball right like i'll show you on camera. yeah so like i hear right and it, my it, elbow doesn't will start to turn yeah yeah start to pronate so with the curveball you want your wrist right like you want your wrist like neutral so yeah, supinated yeah. right yeah and throw it like this so when i go into full throw and try to get challenge you know end range of my my elbow extension my wrist will go 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, cause it, so like, I couldn't, couldn't throw that. And I love my curveball. <laughs> <laughs> so that was unfortunate. <laughs> But then, uh, so 2017 come back and that was just another weird thing. I go from thinking that this organization loved me. They brought me back, paid me a good amount of money to come back. Got to experience like my true actual first big league spring training around all the guys thought I fit in. And then last day of camp, we're going to release you. And I'm like, wait, (laughs) what just happened? What? (laughs) Yeah. You know? And so you're kind of sitting there in one mindset of like, man, things are going good, baby. We're freaking on the, we're doing this thing, you know? And then in one conversation, your world changes. It's like, what? (laughs) And and through this whole process, you have an agent, I'm assuming, obviously. Yeah. And where, yeah. where is his, like, where's the, his or hers? Like, where's your agent's mindset? Where, what, what's their feedback with all, with all this? Oh, dude, like, I'll never forget that conversation because I called him. And uh, I was like, anyone need somebody? <laughs> getting getting released in spring training is the worst, right? Because everyone's getting released. Everyone's getting rid of guys. Yeah, no yeah. one's bringing guys on. So I called him. I was like, I need a job. He's like, what? It's like, I just got released. And he was just so, like, baffled. It was the first time I've, like, seen my agent, like, baffled you know, and I've been through the ringer. So I understand, like, I'll never forget the first time I called him and said, I got released. He was like, yeah, I know that was coming. Yeah. You said, I got you. But this one was like, holy smokes, dude. Like, okay, I guess we'll get on the phone and like, see what we got. But you know, you get released in in spring training. It's just like, what are you going to do? Were you, were you bullpen or is trying to be a starter at that point? Were you bullpen? No. So I was bullpen guy. Yeah. Yeah. So that's when I kind of made a career move coming back to St. Louis. When I first got the opportunity, it was like, that was when I had first experienced that like back end of the bullpen, you know, eighth inning closer type role. And that was really cool. I I think my personality really kind of meshed with that. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, so 2017 that, that happened and I was like in Florida. So I was like, frick, I gotta go back to California now. Like what's the next move? It's kind of just a waiting game. And then it was like, all right, I guess we go play indie ball. And that opened up that whole new world for me. <laughs> Do you were 25 at this point? 26, <sighs> 2017. I was 20. So you're looking at three, four, five 25. years, 25, 25, 25. 25. So, but shoot, that, dude, that's how baseball is in terms of the age dynamic. Like, you wake up one day and you're young and immature. Yeah. And then the next day, you're too old for the game. Yeah. Which that's is how crazy. quick it goes. Yeah. Yeah. It's better I mean, is now it, that as, as a pitcher, I mean, there's more opportunity in your, in your mid to later 20s. But I mean, if you're a position guy, yeah. like a catcher or something like that, yeah. 19, 20, 21, 22, you're done by 22. You're, oh my gosh. No one's even looking my, at you. My dad retired at 30 at 31 32 and he said like and this is a testament to why i will play this game until i can't yeah he said like when i retired i was in the best shape of my life and i was like what (laughs) you know like i mean now i'm 30 and it's like it's true like i feel freaking fantastic i feel better now than i did at 18 (laughs) yeah but your 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 physical level of your training your understanding of your body understanding of mechanics understanding of like just just motion and, 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 and from your hip mo- rotation, your hips, your, yeah. your ankles, like, like when you watch your videos, like you get the fitness aspect of it. you get the nutritional aspect of you. I thought you, you, oh, were yeah. on your, you went on your crazy fasting for a while and, oh and having your t- like, so you, you've, you've played around with enough that you fine tuned it to figure out what's right for you. So you should oh, be, 100%. you should be the next five, five to six years, if not more, probably in the yeah. best physical shape of your life. And probably yeah, the yeah, strongest yeah. you could be like, you were probably, right. you're probably not even at the cusp of what you're able to do. Right. Cause you've done so right. much to take care of yourself. Right. Right. So yeah. 100%. Independent ball. So you've been in the independent ball now for five years. This so 2017 was my, yeah. So 2017 was my first experience with, I went to Lincoln, Nebraska, my third outing got hit with a 110 mile an hour comebacker in the nose. <laughs> like this journey, dude, I can't make this stuff up. Had to miss time. Like, concussed i was gonna say con- massive nose. massive concussion massive concussion man but people will argue that i'm just i act like i'm always concussed so it's fine <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i had to deal with that <laughs> and then um yeah and then come back oh we're, we're, we're is there, it was in indiana you played you said 
You're first independent? No, Lincoln, Nebraska. Nebraska. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nebraska. And and were yes. these and were there any of these independent leagues uh, teams attached to major league teams or no? Not at the time. They are okay. now. Yeah. I yeah. think okay. all of them are now partners. Okay. okay. Which I don't know if anyone still to this day knows what even that means. <laughs> but but they are. And and that was actually the first time. So this was 2017. That mm-hmm. was the first time where I had a had a kind of a a uh an awakening to holy smokes indie ball is legit right like yeah. there's a lot of good players because you have this and i think a lot of people have this kind of misconception when it comes to indie ball you think of like adult men's league almost right like everyone on yeah. tiktok always gives me crap because i'm playing indie ball and it's like the way that the mlb has done it over the last couple of years with taking away the jobs from the minor leaguers like are you aware like they took oh, away, yeah. Like, yeah, all yeah, those yeah 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 and, and oh i mean gosh. and during covid i mean the bare fact oh that they gosh. cut and cut and cut I'll, I'll give you a quick little story um our president of our league the here in in brampton where we my son plays and, and where i'm part of um his son was playing in uh peru uh, per, purdue college uh-huh um, catcher star, um, complete Zach uh, Fascia, complete stud there. And it was his draft year and, um, got drafted by, I think it was Cleveland, if I'm not mistaken, and decided to get out of the, go back to school to finish, finish his last uh-huh. year, finish last year. And then COVID hit. And oh, then the draft frick. was shrunk. And this guy, if oh. I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, he got the, uh, the oh, God catcher of the year, which, which is, um oh my god what's the uh cincinnati reds uh hall of fame catcher johnny Johnny bench johnny bench award like this guy was stud like complete complete stud so next year missed the draft year then he's going into his draft year at 23 and um ended up just signing same thing signing a free agent contract with cleveland he's been been in the cleveland system for the last year and a half this guy's like six three six four like 220 crazy arm super athletic um, oh and uh, now he's just in the minors and, and, and hoping he doesn't get cut, which is crazy. Yeah. Right. And, and yeah. so the whole minor I, system is just crazy. Yeah. I feel so bad for that. Those guys, man, like I've heard so many stories about COVID and like how it just, just, I mean, you're talking about a career, like what a hundred percent that, that one year, like, how many guys just this, I mean, they cut it down to just one round if I'm not mistaken. Right. No, draft it was, year. It was ten rounds, right? Ten rounds. I, I they cut it, it down. I know they cut yeah. it down. Well, it went from like it went from like forty. Yeah. to Ten. Okay. Okay. That's what it was. I remember the number one in the front. Though. So it was just it. It. But that's hundreds and hundreds of opportunities oh gone. Oh man. Well, they. I mean, think about like so when I first got drafted, right? So we yeah. had a a rookie league. We had an AZL, which was the Arizona league, yeah. and then we had a advanced rookie league. Right. So that's three teams. You're looking at 27 to 28 players on each of those three teams. And, and those are all gone now. All gone. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, dude, yeah. when they cut, they cut 10,000 like minor yeah. league players. Yeah. And yeah, so that's crazy. a testament to like indie ball right now is very, very good. Yeah. Very, very we, good. we have, we have and a I'm few, we have a few really, really good guys that were both cut. Uh, one guy was cut from St. Louis. One guy was cut from, he was with the Jays, tra- tra- traded to, God, was he traded to Arizona and he was cut as well during the whole process. And they're both playing Quebec. It was funny you said that. They went to you and yeah. playing Quebec. They both play Quebec indie ball in Quebec. A, oh my gosh, they're so good. They're a powerhouse. I love playing there because it's electric. Yeah. I, well, I've, that's a that that is the biggest compliment I give is they're so passionate about their sports. Yeah. Yeah. So cool story was in 2021. It was uh I got to start the first day that they were allowed to have fans back there oh cool COVID. In and Quebec? it was just like yeah yeah very was, cool we were the first team to travel across the border because they had shut it down right so then quebec that year became like a traveling team they couldn't yeah 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 yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Our series we, we just matched up to where like all right they they opened the borders and it was like that was my first canadian experience and it was like this is freaking different man like they were just oh they missed they missed their expos right they're they're dying for baseball there there's there's a lot oh, of hardcore yeah. fans in, in quebec hardcore fans man yeah. i mean they've never never been the same and they'll and they'll never transfer to j fans whoever was a quebec an expo fan will never be a j fan that is that no. is 100 percent. they won it all again this year they did quebec. again huh yeah 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 they're very, good, very man. Good. so your journey now you're doing your your fall you're doing your winter ball like where's your mind like where 
obviously majors is is where you want to get back to yeah um you have yeah, you like so, as are you, are you still with an agent or how does this work in indie ball yeah like technically i am um but it's like I, I honestly i don't really deal with you know the agent unless it's like hey we have a job opportunity for you you know it's kind of one of those things um this is a very interesting time in my in my life honestly it's like uh the big leagues is always going to be the goal and yeah. we we've already discussed about how like just crazy things happen in this game yeah that, like if if you just you know are in the right place at the right time and the right opportunity comes like you could be there you know and and i'm fully aware of that and i'm i'm prepared for that but there's this sense of like peace knowing that i have done everything that i could possibly do within my control to put yeah. myself in that position if it doesn't help out or if it doesn't happen then um then i'm content right like i'm i'm okay cuz i'm doing something right now that i feel i have a purpose for and yeah. i think that's that's what anyone really desires right in life in general is just like give me purpose and give me fulfillment and those two are probably correlated so it's like i have a sense of uh, a purpose with what i'm doing and i have this kind of sense of responsibility to having gone everything having gone through everything that i've gone through man it's like how could i not share this right like how could i not how can I not try to, you know, inspire somebody else? Right. Or, I mean, there's a whole different side of this too, right? There's this side of like everything that I've experienced and how I can help other people through their experiences. And then the whole other side of just like, how can I show guys that maybe are struggling with the same thing I struggled when I was in 2014 with the mental stuff? how can I show them the simplicities of the game and how can I show them the beauty of this game? Because it's really hard oftentimes to love a game that is built on failure because we don't want to identif identify with failure. Right. And it's really hard, especially at a, at a young age to, to identify with that. And it's, there's this fine line, man. And it's like, I'd still kind of work towards navigating that uh, in terms of, you know, this really really hard complicated game but finding these simplicities within that and uh and, and like really just attaching yourself to the simplicities that can then promote this sense of joy right because anything that's i don't know i'm a, i might be weird because anything that's super hard and you find a little bit of success at it you're like ooh. Yeah, of course. More, of course. Of right. Course. And it's, I mean, it's that, that, that could from, that could uh, that could translate to any 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 aspect of life, right? Anything. And it's yeah. a quote from a, a League of Their Own when he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, Tom yeah. Hanks, when he's like, it's the <laughs> hard that makes it beautiful, right? And that's I I just, I, I I find so much. Kind so of I I saw you running gun. I saw you running gun the other day. One of your videos, one hundred three. So what is your what is your mindset? Do you do you want to do you want to get to hundred? Oh gosh, it's always the mindset. It's funny. Though, Cause I'm two different guys. Right. So like when I'm in the regular, so this past year, I actually served as a player coach. So I was pitching coach for our team. Oh, very cool. Starting pitcher. Okay. I was going to, I wanted, I wasn't going to get into that next, but go, go. Yeah. I, yeah. I wasn't even so, aware of that, but that's awesome. Here you go. Yeah. It was amazing. Like I, I, I lived out two passions. Did right? you get two, like, did I'm you get very, two, did you get two salaries? Gosh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> I love this stuff so much, man. That I probably just did it for free. Right. <laughs> No, I, uh, so yeah, that was like my first experience doing both. And, uh, although I love, it's, it's such a weird mental state, honestly, because I love doing it, but yeah. it really affected like my actual performance as a pitcher because I was like, I wasn't focused on my personal development. I was You're focused on everyone else's. Right? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that was the hard part of navigating that, um, because I found myself like really struggling and not finding enough time for my own work. Right. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but I'm two different guys in the sense of as a starter, I'm like, I'm like high, low, like mid to high eighties, touch a 92, maybe if I want to, Yeah. I throw seven different pitches, trying you to throw fool seven guys. pitches. And then, and then winter ball comes around and I just transform into this hashtag reliever Rob, you know, and I try to throw a hundred and I have three pitches and like, let's go. What, to work. what are they? So Fast, I, fastball slider. Yeah, so a fastball, slider, and changeup. Yeah, yeah. What's your changeup at? And you know, and, and, and slow. And, and, it's seventy-five. Well, I throw it like this. I got the Vulcan. Yeah, seventy-five. So I, that's a that's like a, that throws people off, especially if you're throwing high nineties. That's that's yeah. a, that's a good pitch. 
If yeah. you get located nicely, that's a good good pitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 interesting because everyone's always like, "Well, what do you enjoy more, starting or relieving?" Yeah, I was like, I know for a fact I'm just better at relieving. Like I've I've noticed that since I was in 2015 with St. Louis. Like I my stuff plays better, personality kind of matches, but there's nothing better than that starting pitching routine. There's yeah. nothing better, man. Like yeah. one day but, is yours. Yeah. Like but if you, yours, but if you if you if you could focus and tone on and, and really hone your 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 energy. I mean, if you look at Jay's Jordan Romano, I mean that's a guy that mm. was in the system. The Jays trade him. He goes. Mm-hmm. To, I don't know if you know the whole thing. Trade him. Goes to Texas, and then yeah. they sign him a like year later. With everybody thought like this is a local guy that would actually train like train at our local facility. Yeah, my son trains at. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. local kid. So we we see him all the time, and uh, gets traded to Texas. Super nice guy. Such a good guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, gets traded to Texas, and and we're like, okay, he's done. He'll be in the minors, and chances of coming up, or and then all of a sudden he's back and. A year later, he's our starting closer, right? Just it's oh my crazy. Yeah. And you talk to him, he's always, always, he was a starter in the minors, but he always wanted to be a he always wanted to be in the bullpen. That was his passion. Oh, he? he wanted to be in the bullpen. So it's the pure opposite, right? Yeah. I mean, when you're talking about throwing high 90s with a couple of pitches and your personality, like like I, I see the bullpen, man. I see it, man. Oh, I see, yeah. You see Diaz oh. come out with his music and that trumpet. I mean, you just this there's an excitement to that, right? Oh, well, I just uh, yeah, like <laughs> I, I know just the overall stuff just plays better, you know, because like there's so much of the the game within the game when it comes to starting. Yeah. And even though I love it, like I love the sequencing and like flipping the lineup over and OK, I threw this, this, this guy, this his first at bat. Now the yeah. second at bat, I'm going to show him this and switch up the looks and yeah. all of the little things. But that takes a toll on my performance because I'm so up here and I've already kind of yeah. discussed like yeah. how to, yeah. for me to be the best version of myself, I need to turn this guy off. Yeah. Go in, just, go in and out, do your stuff. Yeah. 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 Just keep it simple, man. Just freaking just go. So I'm looking forward to that. Like I'll, I'll leave here in a week and I'll get to do that this, this winter. So it's kind of cool. What, man. What, like, do you have, are you, do you have anywhere signed for next year? Or are you saw the same with the same team in New York? Or are you looking to try to hopefully after, mm-hmm. after winter ball, get on a get on a get on a field in spring training somewhere pro yeah yeah i don't, I don't know I, I i there's so much like mystery and joy in the unknown i love it you know like as a ball player you get you get that and it's like are you have you have that. you been talking to any teams at all uh no so i won't really talk to teams until like winter ball actually starts and like yeah. i'll start like you know teams will reach out and stuff because they see me you know throwing like uh yeah winter ball is usually the the one thing that like gets me actually a lot of interest because i am a reliever and like you know there's i I do pretty well over there um so like that's how i got signed by texas in 2018 i got signed by the rangers yeah out of indie ball because that was uh you know in 2017 uh i got to i was playing in puerto rico but i got to go to the caribbean world series in 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 mexico and uh when you get to do that there's like a lot of scouts you know yeah, and yeah. stuff and i was throwing the ball really well at the time and who, and who, what team did you play for so i was with the puerto rican team in the world in the so how does that work Caribbean. how does that work like so in the puerto wise. rican league yeah so the puerto rican league the winter the winner yeah, from yeah. that league moves on to the caribbean series so right? it's like any other oh, league, like the dominican venezuelan yeah, 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 Cuban, yeah, yeah. colombian yeah. panama yeah like all the so they play like a caribbean world series people get it mistaken with like the world baseball yes Classic. yes that, that was what i was thing. thinking about right now yeah. Yeah. yeah okay okay yeah the caribbean world series is uh is from like all the winter leagues okay right? so really everyone cool. yeah. kind of every country has like somewhat of a winter league yeah, yeah. it's like the winter the winter man that's hard to say the winner of that league will move on to the caribbean series and it's in a different spot every year so that was a cool opportunity and then i got signed by texas and uh well that was when i that's a whole nother freaking story went to texas blew my lat out and that was when like my brand started was it was in 2018 i knew i was going to miss a substantial amount of time and i was like perfect writing's on the wall let's dive in I remember, I remember seeing that. I remember seeing that. And yeah, and you, and you, and you follow your journey all the way through. I want to ask you, I got, I got three more questions for you. Um, pitching, you said pitching coach, and that was something I've been playing around with my head because I wanted to ask you that from the beginning, but I wanted to wait till more of the end. Do you see yourself eventually getting to that role into like, into the majors or into, into a, 
a pro team as a pitching coach because you you obviously know your shit and obviously know how to teach it and you know how to break it down. Is that somewhere you can see yourself in ten years doing? I don't think so, man. I don't think so. I, I don't You're know if good I should at say it. this on air, but <laughs> I love. Uh, I don't like. I love the private sector. Like I love the one on one stuff. Yeah, and uh, and I love just like. I love doing my own thing, right? Like I, I've intentionally have done what I've done with my brand to put myself in a position to where like I don't have to listen to anyone. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can do what no, I want. And yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, there's that's all... being that's being an entrepreneur, which is I've been, yeah, well, I've, been I've doing seen... that for twenty seven years, right? I understand oh, man. it. Facts, yeah. But I've seen like the the puppeteering that is yeah. professional baseball at a time. Right. Yeah. And I get it. Like, it's no disrespect on anyone. I understand if you're running an organization, you want everyone to be on the same page. The guys, that get, the guys that get paid the most money are going to have probably more say than there's, you know, and like, that's just something that kind of has always turned me off from like, you know, the, uh, the coaching aspect of it. Like, if I'm going to be passionate about my coaching, I'm going to be passionate about my players. Like, I want to make sure that I'm doing as I see fit for their benefit, knowing yeah. what I have gone through from both the mental and physical side. Yeah. And, uh, and there might not always be an agreement there, but yeah. I know when I'm on the private sector, like the things that I do from a remote training standpoint right now. And like, you know, once we hop off this, I'll, I'll run over to the park and do my physical lessons with guys, but it's all me. Like I get to have that say in, in what I see to be the best. You do, know, you, that, do you, do you eventually place. see yourself doing, oh, I'm, I'm throwing this question at you. I've, I've owned a gym. I've done other stuff. Do you see yourself owning a facility eventually? Yeah, I think okay, so. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I want to like, I'm in a good spot, but right now it's, it's difficult because I'm, I'm still focused. Yeah. This is later on, on my stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, yeah. And there's still a good think, opportunity for you to get to where you want to get to and at yeah. least live, live out that dream. I think there's a huge possibility for that still to happen. So, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm too stubborn, man. I think I'll, I'll be 47 and I'll be like, nope, I still got it. I still got it, baby. Let's go. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think that is, that is definitely something that I want to explore. Um, and from, I think your you know, your branding right now is on is on par. Like your branding is 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 hitting it, and and everything you're doing, and just your your oh, mechanics, thanks, and your breakdown videos, and all that. It just yeah. is leading you to having a very successful facility, very yeah. successful facility. I, I totally see that happening. Your father, what does your dad mean to you? What does he mean to me? Yeah, tell me what your dad means to you. He means, I mean, it's a very like simple, complex answer or question. Whoa. I spent a lot of my younger years kind of, I'm going to say this for lack of a better phrase, taking my dad for granted. I didn't realize when I was younger, what it meant to be like prepared in such a way to like, at least provide yourself with confidence and conviction for what you were trying to do and accomplish. Okay. So what I mean by that is there's truth in confidence stemming from what you put into it, right? Yeah. And he did that with me without me even like knowing it at a young age. So he instilled in me this desire to always be prepared, whether it be on the baseball field, the basketball court, or even in the classroom. And that is that just that goes beyond anything that I could ever like appreciate in life because that he molded that into me right? indirect like that, in, that i call it indirect mentoring right right yeah miyagi me yeah. <laughs> wax on but um and i never knew it and as i get older i've always like i'm just a very very curious individual and i'll sit there and be like okay why am i this way why do i just have this burning desire to work hard and accomplish this and want to do that and want to do and i look back and it's like well he, that's that's pops that's mom too right it's just parent is just good parenting and i'm so appreciative for that um you know and and still like i mean shoot man i come back you know there's a reason why when i am done with my season i come back and i and i bunk up with mom and dad for x amount of weeks until i go to my next spot you know because yeah i i i really do um you know find myself as a as a better version of myself when i'm around you know, that, that crowd. And it's something that, uh, I'll never have to sit there and thank him for 
because he knows that that was just him, you know, being a dad and at the same time, just being a very good coach. And, um, honestly, it was, it was my doing of my early struggles in my career. Um, because I was too like stubborn and prideful to continue to listen to his mentoring right throughout that. But at the same time, and he'll attest to this too, is like, that was just something that I needed to go through a learning process. Yeah. 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 For me to, to truly see that through, you know, his lens. So I, I love yeah, that. Man, I, I mean, he's, he, he, you've probably seen my videos. He's freaking. I, that, that's, he's still that's, doing it. That's, that's why I'm, that's why I asked you. I mean, I, I, my dad was my best friend and I lost my dad about 17 months ago. And, and I, and I teach people this all the time. I coach a bunch of guys and I, I teach people living with no regrets and just like yeah. you playing cash still with your dad. You oh going gosh. home and bunking with your parents and being them and spending that time oh, with man. them. These are all things that you're building these memory, this only memory bank that one day yeah. when they're not here, knock on wood, it's a long time from oh, now. Th- th- those are the things that you're going to hold to your heart the rest of your life. Oh God. And those stories. Well, like, so I, I, I think that's so special. And I love that. That's why I'm saying that. Cause I love seeing those videos of you and your dad playing yeah. cash still. Oh, it's, awesome. it's the, it's probably the most fun content that I create. And yeah, like, it's it. funny how it's happened yeah. because so my dad actually, and this is a whole nother side of this. My dad was the one that instilled this, I guess, desire to always film my stuff. So my dad filmed, like, we still have video from when I was like nine years old in Little League, like always filming. Which and is, awesome, which is awesome for later on in life to get a documentary oh going. Gosh. You, when Except you... knowing my daddy lost it. It's all good. <laughs> like, he just like, didn't know where he put it. But, uh, but now, like, so when I first came back, so I spent my entire rehab from my lat surgery in Omaha. I was training out there and that was kind of when I first opened my brand and I was just nomad freaking yeah. all on my own. I loved yeah. it. And then I came back here right before COVID hit and like we would throw together and uh and he would be like super anti don't want to be on camera don't want to be on the mic and now it's like i told him yesterday too i was like yesterday's gonna be a light day like i won't even bring the camera he's like oh i don't want to go then i'm like well, well this has gone full circle <laughs> but you know but um yeah so i actually i almost lost my dad too he's had some heart complications over the past few years i'm not like super vocal about this but like it's another thing that you kind of sit there and realize almost, you know, you don't realize how much you love something until it's gone and yeah. you live every day. You know, for me, um, i just was so fortunate growing up because I always had a catcher and then I had a brother that was a catcher. So it was like, anytime I needed a throw, anytime I needed anything, like they were, my family is so freaking supportive of this journey of this dream. But, uh, he had some, some heart complications, you know, he's like, it, he had to get, uh, an assisted living device put in his chest. And there was this, you know, we might not, have them after this like this is a very risky surgery blah 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 and that's when it was like holy smokes right like i i can't take this not for granted but it was just but you like have i a, gotta you have a second chance which is yeah so, and it was like yeah. i gotta i gotta truly like i gotta i gotta be mindful of that that at any point in time like it could just be gone yeah you know? that, Whether that's, it be, that's 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 me honestly that was that was may, may 7th uh last year it was just yes. uh it was no year and a half now. So a year before, and, uh, it was just, uh, Friday for, it was, a. I I used to talk to my dad two to three times a day. And, yeah. uh, we talked on uh, May 6th, it was 10 at night. I tell the story all the time. We talked to talk the night, had a conversation for about 20, 30 minutes on the phone. And then I got that call and you always hear if you get a call at six in the morning, it's not a good call. And I got that call yeah. Friday at six in the morning and he just got up, went to the bathroom, walked back to my mom, never smoked, never drank power walked every day, just collapsed. And I was it done heart attack. Oh, and so there's no, there was no, there's no goodbye. There's no closure to it. Right. Yeah. So, um, you having that and understanding that appreciate yeah. them. I appreciate that brother. I mean, it's, oh, yeah. it's so special. It's so, well, I'm so sorry special. to hear that. Yeah. That's it's, it's life, right? It's life. I mean, but you have that opportunity to still, and you're young still to have the opportunity to really, really right. do these things with them. And so it's pretty cool that you're still doing that. And I appreciate that. That's why I had to bring yeah. that up and ask. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, it's everyone too. It's like we, cause like my whole family will, will roll up to the park. Like we freaking haven't missed a beat since we were, my brother was 11 and I was eight. Like we've yeah. been doing this, right? Like this is yeah. our life, man. Like, yeah. I, I kid you not. We've been doing this since I was born. And since my brother was born, he's three years older than me, but this has been our life. And it literally just like, we don't change it. <laughs> like, yeah, I love it. I love like it. we're like, hey, it's time to go to the parks, man. Yeah, like, yeah. like, let's go. Like everyone's a part of this, right? Yeah, and that's I why like I say I'm gonna be able to do this and I'm gonna be able to see this journey out yeah. for as long as I can due to the support, support. of the that I have. 
right? Yeah. Like yeah. it's it's a testament to that. So yeah. I mean, as I get older and as I still continue to get older, I just start seeing it so much more clear each yeah. and every day, just how appreciative I am of that. Yeah. And I do my best to, to be super just mindful of it every single day. But you know how time is. Time yeah. goes by so fast. So fast. And, uh, you know, and it's like, I'm, I'm, how, I'm, how much I'm, control I'm, do we have? Of that? You don't. I'm 45 and I feel like I'm 30 still. I take care of myself, but mentally I yeah, feel like I'm great. like 25, 30. I got a 16 year old daughter and a 14 year old son. Like time flies by. Yeah. Time flies by. And I'm and, and I'm a very active dad. Like I'm they're they're my workout partners. We go to the gym every single day together. I do baseball with my yeah. son every day. I do track my dog. So I, I I try to be as active, just like a dad is active and as part of yeah. their everyday journeys as much as I can now. Cause I realize yeah. once they go to college and stuff, life life changes, right? So nice. um yeah, this is awesome. This has been awesome, brother. It's let's let's I, I don't want to take more of your time. It's already been an hour and a half. Where could our audience find you? How could they get a hold of you? If somebody wants pitching, coaching, like give me all the information. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I mean, the better question is where, where, where can they not find me? Holy smokes. I'm everywhere, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm everywhere, man. Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, freaking MySpace. Remember MySpace? I do man, remember MySpace. <laughs> Holy smokes. All right. P Tom. Um, so Instagram, Robbie row one, two, TikTok, Robbie row one, two, TikToks just the move i guess yeah it, it, it now yeah but you can't get a hold of no one you can't get a hold of you on tiktok but you can follow no. you yeah but no, tiktok is if, I, I just got on it about six weeks ago and it's just yeah the first time i'm like i held on for the longest time and i'm like now i just run it with yeah. my podcast but uh it's podcast it's, clips do well yeah they're, they're doing well, well. It's, TikTok, it's taking yeah. off yeah it's taking off yeah. Yeah. because I, we sure got a lot of yeah we get a lot a lot of big guests so it's it's taking off um i'm utilizing their name so it's, it's helping helping yeah. the, uh, the growth pretty quickly right yeah yeah so the it's so funny how this whole thing so my whole brand like started with podcasting i was literally yeah. just like remember being in puerto rico just like i love to talk <laughs> i'm gonna start a podcast and just would just throw in my apple freaking headphones and yeah. just like would just talk and it was like one thing led to another you know and it was like oh i'm gonna create content like i always filmed everything because i was just yeah. obsessed with the process of it but now i was like i'm gonna create it oh that's great so my my podcast is uh, the Robbie Rowe Show, uh, the Robbie Rowe Show baseball podcast, I believe. Um, and if if you're listening, and you want to reach out, whether it be like mental stuff or baseball or whatever, I actually have a question platform on my website, the Robbie Rowe Show dot com slash ask. Um, if you if you want to reach out, because I stopped like it, it's so weird how it all just kind of happened in the blink of an eye. I went from being the guy that was like, I'm going to answer every single direct message. I'm going to respond to every comment. And now it's like, shoot, dude, overwhelmed. I feel so bad. I feel yeah. so bad because I like, I can't, you know, kind of talk to people and whatnot. So that's, uh, that's probably the best way it goes right to my inbox. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm everywhere. I love what I do. I'm very, very, very fortunate to be able to do what I do. But at the same time, it's really cool because like everyone has the ability to, to do this, right? We live in such yeah. a very unique day and age with connectivity and cameras and freaking microphones, man. It's so cool in that regard. So you know, it's, I mean, awesome. you've been doing it for 27 years, so you get it. It's, it's like, it's such a oh. grind. It's so monot it's so hard, but at the same time, like, it's so joyful to wake up and be like, I'm doing this for like, let's for go. yourself, however, for yourself, however yeah. much I put into it is what I'm going to get back. That's hundred percent, hundred percent. And your, and your energy is infectious too, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. I try. I try. I appreciate this, bro. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. Heck yeah. No, thank you, man. Thank you for having me. Thank you.